one of the things that I wanted to quickly bring up as well was like the sound design of this film was fantastic. The way a door oh, would open or creak, the way a child would step on this on on a wooden floor and you'd hear that creaking or the door or, or a knife being unsheathed. It's it's so funny you the say waves. that because I don't think about the fully waves. like the fully sound in a lot of movies because again it's one of those things you take for granted. Yeah, but when it's done well. And my God, the boy in the heron does it beautifully. Amazingly. I was thinking about every sound effect. A lot of times I would look up because I could just feel the thunder and the rumble of, of yeah. what of what we were in. And I just, I don't know, I just kept looking up like, is that outside or is that in the movie? Like, it's, it just it felt so <laughs> yeah. real. I'm like, man, the sound design on this film from the, the creaking of, of, of Mahito walking up the wooden stairs to the grass to this. The, the crackling of the fire even. The crackling yeah, of the, the fire, the buzzing just, of the, the arrow oh and how God. it just, yeah. it felt like you were wind. They captured the wind so well yeah. In, yeah. This, uh, in this film. Hello and welcome to the movie podcast at TIFF. My name is Daniel. I am one of your hosts today. And joining alongside me are my fellow birds of prey. It's Anthony. Hello. I, I don't want to be called a bird of prey. I'm I'm more of a heron of of, of any type of bird. I don't know if they eat animals, okay. but uh, I mean they're a little they're a little scary guess, in this film. I'll I be honest with you. Maybe fish. Maybe fish. Yeah, we'll we'll get into it more. And Shabazz, hello Shabazz. Hey, uh, I thought this was like a, a Harley Quinn uh, interview for a second there, but uh, birds <laughs> of prey. I'm like, oh, I didn't realize you were. Doing I mean, that. I, so we we were debating some names before. I I, I threw out Budgie Bros. Yes, my uh, my parakeet compadres yeah. i don't think we did say but that would have been a good one too yeah that would have been a good um, one there's, that been good. there's a there's a bunch there's a lot of different birds did you guys ever have birds as pets growing up yeah i had um i had parrots and then um you know they had to go live on the farm as my mom told me oh no uh, okay and then much later like my family got a oh my god i'm forgetting the type of bird it is uh, throw some birds out there for me. What are we cockatoo? Like, cockatoo. That's it. The first one. Yeah, you threw I had out. a feeling. I feel like you told me you had a cockatoo. Yeah, growing cockatoo up. was it is. Yeah. I was like, it was called like a chiquita. No, <laughs> throw some birds out. Throw it's some gonna, birds out, out there. Appear out of my sleeves. Some doves. And, I was John yeah. Woo. I had some doves. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anthony, how about you? Were you a man of the birds? No birds in my house. No birds. No, no birds animals until like later on when I became an adult. We had. I like. And I have my dog, had, but other than dog, that, there's no. No type of flying animals in the house. No. <laughs> yeah. I'm the, if anyone's going to fly in this house, so it's, it's going to be, be me. Do you remember, you know? do you remember like a <laughs> few a weeks ago, I sent you guys a text that there was a falcon in my backyard, mm-hmm. a baby falcon. Yeah. Yes, that was did. crazy. That was crazy. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, my crazy. name means falcon. Is this a sign? And as soon as I go. opened the door, it was like, Wah! and I like flew away. Here's like, a, oh, maybe the, maybe this movie's about you, Shabazz. Small story. I, maybe it is. A short story. Story. Short, short story. Uh, there was a falcon in my backyard maybe four months ago, and it was uh, mm. eating another bird. It was st- oh. like it was pounding the bird into the ground, and then it took it to the fence. Oh. And, wow. just, and all you would see is feathers. Imagine if it was like beating up the bird like with its like wings too. It, had, like, like, it was like, come on, let's go. And they were like squaring up. It was each just other. being manhandled by this falcon. And, it, and no, all wow. you could see once it brought it to the fence, just feathers being, you know, like. Like a pillowcase of oh, feathers dude. just everywhere. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thing ate it. Um, I also had birds growing up. You did? <laughs> I, had, uh, I had birds, yeah. I had two budgies. Oh. Um, they were great. I had them for a very long time. And, uh, you know, rest in peace to them. But today, you know, the, we're, this is not the only... We, I think this started off very dark, this episode. It did. With, like, it got this, a little dark the, in the beginning. The, the beating of these birds. Uh, but we're going to be talking a lot more about birds beating up on each other because this is our review of the boy and the heron this is tiff's opening night film this is the i think one of the biggest films that has ever opened up the festival i think it's also uh the one that a lot of people have just been so excited and ravenous to get tickets for last year it was a taylor swift uh in conversation with this year it's boy and the heron um and we're so lucky that we got to watch it and we're going to talk all about it very soon but of course this is the movie podcast you can catch a brand new episodes of our show all throughout the week we're at tiff right now so there are so many tiff reviews out and so many more coming your way so make sure you're following us on social media on all platforms twitter tiktok letterbox instagram at the movie podcast you can follow along with everything that's going on with tiff all the events interviews and reviews that we are releasing also join our discord we're having some great conversations in there 
with TIFF films as well as well as everything else going on in the world of entertainment right now with games, with movies, with shows. Uh, we have an Ahsoka room open as well too. So if you're watching Ahsoka and you still can't get over the craziness that was this weekend, what's coming very, very soon, hopefully in the show, uh, make sure you join our Discord. We're having a great time in there. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Uh, let us know if you're looking forward to watching this film. Let us know if you think it's uh, Hayao Miyazaki's last film because as we have found out that going into this, you know, it was going to be his last film, but now he's like, you know what? Maybe I want to keep making movies. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we do. Maybe we don't. Miyazaki's uh, uh, but this the is Rocky of the <laughs> animation world. Always never wants to retire. Every uh, every film that comes out, you're like, this is the last one. This is the last one. So it looks like this isn't going to be the last one, which is good because we want more uh, Studio Ghibli films coming out into the world. Uh, this one does not have a wide release date yet, but it is out in Japan. And what was so interesting with this film as well is that there were no trailers released for it in Japan before it came out. It literally was just that one poster that we got with the heron on it. And then that's all we got. We finally had a trailer that just dropped in line with its premiere at TIFF. Uh, but Anthony, before you get to your first reaction of the film, I'd love for you to drop some knowledge on us. You were doing a little bit of a deep dive into this film to find out more and become one with the birds. Uh, <laughs> I would love for you to tell us more about uh, what you discovered uh, on your journey. Yeah, no, it's just it's a simple thing. Like you, anyone can like find it, but pretty much, I was yeah, I was researching. Okay. I was researching <laughs> it because there was so much. There was immediately so, not exclusive the information. Research. Immediately yeah. is like honestly, it's not even important. Let's get past yeah. it. Yeah. Did you know that Hayao Miyazaki <laughs> is from Japan? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you, Anthony. <laughs> no, but you know, Hayao was it, the biggest thing with this film was like there was no marketing for this movie. So I think that was the biggest thing that kind of overshadowed everything about the film. Um, I, I remember reading an article saying, hey, like, there is no marketing for this movie. And we're a little worried that we don't know if, how the audience is going to interpret or even know it's even out. So it, that was that was a, one part of the research that I did. But another part of the research was uh, a little bit about the story and how it really relates to Hayao's uh, childhood and how much it, he... The, the death of his mother affected him growing up because he did like if you when you watch this movie it is the death of uh, of his of this character mojito's mother that really spawns this magical tale that you're kind of brought into in terms of boy and the heron so when it comes to uh miyazaki it almost is like an autobiographical film of his because he kind of grew up in during that time, he was growing up, I guess, after post-World War II, he was growing up in, in Tokyo, and then he kind of moved to, um, the I guess, the the rural areas of Japan. And his father was also manufacturing um, military, I guess, parts or fighter components mm -hmm. to planes. So it's just a lot of things that you will see in this movie that you're going to be like, I wonder where this comes from. But it, it's really Miyazaki's true life story in a, in a sense his mother did die like there is a there's a part of this story that really focuses on a son and and mother bond and the guilt of being in a situation where you um you know when you when you lose someone that's so close to you you kind of feel like you're almost wish you could save them and that's what this story really kind of dives into that's, that's i think what miyazaki felt when he was a child that you know maybe he felt that he could have saved his mom and and, and the guilt that comes with it. And then the selfishness that, you know, when you are a child, you kind of, you feel you are selfish. Like yeah, all, all children are selfish, but then you kind of have to mm -hmm. get grow out of that. So there's a lot of like coming of age, but in the idea of this is Miyazaki's life is so interesting because everything that we've kind of encompassed in his career, a lot of it is fantasy. A lot of it is just outside of the world thing. Um, maybe little things relatable, but this really is the most relatable story to his life than all his other work. Yeah, and it's amazing because, like, you know, when this film was announced, uh, it was announced, and it still has the title in Japan, I believe, uh, How Do You Live, which is a, a novel that Miyazaki grew up reading um and then he kind of took that novel and incorporated it and and used it as anthony was saying to you know tell his own story and really tell a story that i think is a story for future generations not only his but for i think future creators coming down the road um anthony i i before we get to your your first reaction and talking about the film i do want to say that this episode of the movie podcast is brought to you by mubi so stay tuned later in the show to hear how you could get a whole month free of incredible cinema that you know 
opens you up to a world of film. So stay tuned for that. Anthony, let's talk about this movie. Let's dive in. What were your thoughts of The Boy and the Heron? I really, really liked Boy and the Heron. I thought it was a fantastic film. Uh, Miyazaki has been part of TIFF for a really long time. I remember going to watch uh, The Wind Rises back in 2013 when he did his Toronto Film Festival premiere for that. It wasn't as much of a, a hype culture at that point so i feel like what we experienced with this movie and all the people who wanted to go see it wasn't as much as what it was back then and it, it's so interesting how much his work and that was 10 years ago really that was his last film was the the wind rises it's wild to think that it's been 10 years since we've got a studio ghibli film in the world it's just amazing to see this guy is 82 years old he's making films that he connects with and he loves and and to learn everything that I just said before about him, it just makes this movie even so much better. Because I was I was a little worried going into it. I know there was a lot of like critics that I've been was watching, and I would hear well, it's not the, his greatest story, but you know it's it's his story, and I think that's the most important part because this has such a such much more of a deeper connection than all his other movies, um, and you can see it in the animation. He tries so many different new things, like especially with the um, the hospital fire in the beginning of the of this film. It just there's animation that's used in there that I've never seen in a studio studio Ghibli film, where it's like he's running through the fumes of flames and it's morphing his character, the character of Mihito, in such a way that it's like engulfing him. It's like it was such a different approach to the typical you know, Studio Ghib- Ghibli animation that we've always had. Yeah, it's almost like water. It was like watercolor. Like it felt like it was almost like fluid in water. It was It was really breathtaking to see. Do you ever see like a fire in the distance and you can actually see like the fl- the flame, but you can also see the, f- the the gas that's coming through it. It almost has like this gassy effect to it as well. Almost, almost like when it's like a hot day and you see the road and like yes, everything looks yes, distorted. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah, I got you. But, the, you know, the story, it's... It's a it's one of those stories that you're going to have to watch again. It, I was trying to find the hidden message to it and I think I learned a little bit more about what the story was. You know, I think the afterlife is a big part of this movie and I remember reading that uh, Hayao wanted to make a film that kind of explained to his grandson like grandpa's not always going to be here, but this is what I've created and what I've left for you is something that hopefully you will continue. If not, that's okay. But it's just an option that's available for you. And I think that's a big, bigger underlying message of the the story as well. It's just like he's coming to terms with his age because he is 82 and, you know, he's not going to live forever. He's not going to be able to make movies forever. But um, I think that's a big part of that film and just being okay with whatever happens at the end of my or whoever's tale at this point um no i just i i really really liked it i can't wait to watch it again i think some this some of his best animation the story at times could be a little fantasy it it reminded me of spirited away just because it dives it's like a child who dives into another universe or another reality Mm -hmm. of sorts very similar to what we got in spirited away when she enters the house it's like this house of of ghosts and and things that are out of this world where, where Mojito also has that vibe where he enters this tower and it's like birds of a feather now. But uh, Yeah, instead of pig people, it's it's birds. It's so birds, it's exactly. Yeah. But yeah, there's, and birds, uh, you know, I never felt so scared of birds in my life. <laughs> Truthfully, there's there's a scene with a pelican that I was like, man, this is, this is something different that we haven't seen in a studio ghibli it's not always family friendly they really dive in there's like blood that's involved there's death there's a lot of things that are happening which is so different than what we've experienced in the past with it but yeah like i i really 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 enjoyed this film i thought you know i i need to rewatch it again i need to understand i think you said it daniel best that this i can't wait for someone to break down the theories behind the philosophical values of what we are watching you know but like I, 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 he has he doesn't make bad movies, man. Like the the stories no. that are are given to you are such intricate, woven and 
true to the heart movies, like even his last one, which was a story about building planes and just dreams, you know, like that's a huge, huge connection for me. And even this understanding loss and, and embracing it in a sense and being okay with it yeah. is, that's another part. There's so much that I, I think you would get on a second watch of this film. The more that you think about this movie, the more you think about The Boy and the Heron, and even for myself, the more it is absorbing into my mind and I'm really thinking on it. Um, and we're, we'll talk a bit about more, more about it soon. Uh, but I do want to touch on something you said because there are a little bit more adult themes in this. And, and when we say adult themes, a little bit more violence and gore than I think we're used to seeing in an animated film. And I think that's so great. And I think, you know, obviously they're they're not afraid of that on, you know, in, in the Studio Ghibli side or uh, like or, or showing that or showing things that are just like, oh, that's a very realistic depiction of a fish being cut open or seeing the guts. And like it's those type of things that I love because it startled me as a as an adult man. Um, and I think it's so important for kids. And we've said this so much on the movie podcast. I think it's so important for kids to have that type of fear because like that's like a real fear. That's not like a like a like a manufactured like horror type feel. Like that is like a, a fear that will unsettle you. And I think those type of experiences start to really form you as a kid. And yeah. we grew up with a lot of movies that scare the shit out of us from like the or, like from the from the seventies, eighties, nineties. And I think that's part of what helps you grow and develop is is having those things that we're like, yeah, that's scary. That episode of Recess was really scary. And like it's like you could have that in a in a natural setting where it's beautiful and just so. Uh, you know, euphoric, but also have those things that kind of really scare you as well, too. Uh, but I'm really excited to talk about more. Shay, you've been quiet for a little while. You've been with the birds right now. Uh, but before we get to your first reaction to the boy Damn and it, Heron, Daniel, let's get it. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> so every minute, say, like, Anthony, we're going to, before we get to it, though, here's a word for our sponsors. Before we get there, though, you know, <laughs> it's the king of, of making you stay tuned. You know, that's the thing. We grew up with TV where we had to wait for the commercials. Oh, so man. tune in for some thoughts on movie. This episode of the Movie Podcast is brought to you by Movie, a global curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. From iconic directors to emerging auteurs, there is always something new to discover. Some recent movie releases include Park Chan Wook's Decision to Leave, Leia Mises' The Five Devils, and Lars von Trier's The Kingdom Trilogy. With Movie, each and every film is hand selected. It's like your own personal film festival, streaming anytime, anywhere. And speaking of festivals, the Toronto International Film Festival is happening right now, and there's a world of cinema in Toronto. And the only other place that you could get a world of cinema at your fingertips is on Movie. Picture this you and your closest friends in a screen loaded with hand picked cinematic gems, all courtesy of Movie. Are you bored of the same old movies available every single streaming service? Movie is the place where you're going to get something that you've never heard of before, and it may just be your next favorite film. You can try a movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash the movie podcast. That's M U B I dot com slash the movie podcast for a whole month of great cinema for free. Wow. And welcome back. Thank you so much for Movie for sponsoring today's episode. Shabazz, you know, fly on in here. Mr. Falcon himself, give us your thoughts to The Boy and the Heron. You know, man, this is a this is a movie, just like you guys kind of said here, where it continues to just kind of linger on the mind as you spend some time away from it. And I'm sure this is just the beginning of the inception that this movie is going to have on me. Um, it almost like, like I haven't watched a studio Ghibli film in a very, very long time, probably since 2013. And I'm sitting here going, Oh my God, I just want to do now a complete binge of all the films prior, because I feel like I I'm, I'm going to watch them with a different lens. Now it's been so long. This movie is beautiful. It's stunning. It's also just very intense. It really gets to the core of you. And it really affected me at some points. And you're talking about dealing with loss and you're dealing with the passing of a torch. There's so much that can be kind of interpreted from this film. And like you guys have been saying as well, I can't wait to see these, these breakdowns of what this movie really is about because it's not only just such an important film within the community, within with Hayao Miyazaki's family, it's an important film for everybody. I think there's going to be someone that's going to take away something from it. It's 
it's kind of gross as well sometimes like the <laughs> like the way some of these characters look you're like oh like you're so ugly but like it works it works the storytelling and it's a movie that i'm going to be thinking about for a very very long time i'm so glad it helped open up tiff because movies like this are so important for people to watch you have um some of the most beautiful animation I've seen in a very long time. 2D animation is just is just a lost form now. And whenever we get it, really want to embrace it. And like Anthony, you were saying in the beginning, there's there's styles of animation that we're seeing here that we haven't either seen before or haven't seen in a very long time. The imagination, like when they're running through the the opening sequence, just the way you're seeing people's faces kind of melted to, I guess, show the intense speed of which a character is running or almost like nothing else matters in the moment other than the objective or the target that he's going towards. There's just so much that you kind of pull away from, man. I, I loved it. I had a great time with it. I think that there is a moment though, in this film towards the end, and I'm sure I'm going to be completely wrong about it, but it almost just felt like we missed a scene. And I talked to a couple of the people about that and it kind of felt like, it jumps ahead or jumps to another portion of the film, which kind of threw me off a little bit. I found it kind of jarring. It's, it's um, jarring for sure. It's very jarring because you're like, oh, okay. And then all of a sudden the scene switches and it's like completely different and they're not even acknowledging what happened. And I'm like, did I blink too long? Like what happened? Like did I miss a certain portion of it? But other than that, this is this is a fantastic film. I mean, if you are a fan of you know Miyazaki, you're a fan of Studio Ghibli's work, you're going in expecting and knowing you're going to be getting something great out of it i am curious in the long run how something like this uh weathers in terms of uh, in, in the whole filmography of his work in my opinion though i do think this should be his last film not only based on his age but also this really kind of feels like the culmination of all the work that he's done it feels like what what more, what other stories can you tell? Because this really feels like your most personal story. This really feels like this is your send-off. I, I almost don't think you need anything after this. Again, if he wants to make another one, all the power to you. But sometimes you got to look at what you're doing and you're like, I think I think this is it. I think this is the best I'm going to be able to give you. And this is the last story I want to leave people with. So I, th- I think, yeah, especially when you look at... The themes of this film, right, and and the uh, the fact of the passing the torch, looking at the next generation, dealing with your mortality, um, like this feels like someone who is saying like this. I'm leaving it all out now. I'm I'm leaving. I'm putting it all in this film because it does feel like Shay was saying like the culmination of his work. And um, you know, just to talk to my experience, like I I. I I think this film is absolutely beautiful. I think you look at the animation of what Studio Ghibli is able to pull off. Um, and when we were driving home, I remember talking specifically about just the way the elements look. And, and Anthony mentioned it a little bit earlier with the way the fire looks, the way the water looks, the way the air and the grass and just the world around you. It is so immersive. You just feel like you could just reach out and touch it. And it's so beautiful because we don't get animation like this from anywhere else. One of the things that Studio Ghibli does and is most like the most iconic thing is that you could tell that's theirs. No matter what they're doing, their art style is so distinct and it flows through every single project that they do. And the boy and the heron is no exception to that rule. It's absolutely gorgeous to look at. I think the story this time around it's 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 deep, it's it's dense, but it's like it's one that's gonna linger with you. Um, and as someone who I've I've seen every studio Ghibli film once they're not films that i typically go back to as often not because i didn't like them or love them it's just because you've watched them and i think they stay with you and it's almost like you i I watch those movies like they are an experience in life where it's like you've experienced it you've you've gone through that memory and you will always have that with you and it's almost sometimes it stays with you more that way instead of something that you will always go go back to um but after watching today like shay like i feel like i want to go back and just revisit their catalog because there is such a a lineage of just incredible storytelling and this film is just so beautiful beginning to end i think um it definitely feels a little bit longer uh, especially the first half of the film i feel like we were staying um with the kind of setup of what was going on. But when things really kind of dive deep into the Alice in Wonderland of it all, you really are just going on this journey. And I think, you know, birds are a big part of it, obviously. Uh, There are a lot of parakeets and budgies and uh, uh, birds that you're like, you know what, I'm going to kind of look at you guys a little bit different way now. But what, what Cedar Ghibli does so well is that there's storytelling and there is so much just, um, telling and an emotion through movement and just the way the birds move the way people move uh it's just so it's just so beautiful just to watch and you could literally watch this film um 
on mute and just be just still, you know, transported by the visuals on screen and following along what's happening still. It, it really is beautiful. And as uh, and someone who's spent hundreds of hours in the worlds of Legend of Zelda, obviously another Japanese property, you see the, those, I think, the inspirations from both sides and what, you know, Studio Ghibli inspired for like uh, Miyamoto and, and Onuma with Zelda and then back and forth that way because there's just such like these th distinct character traits and like these like larger than life personas sometimes that you just kind of you just love and you get lost in and, and watching this one and seeing the water i was just thinking so much of like legend of zelda wind waker and things like that where it's just like yeah it just has those vibes to it this has like this this connection to it and birds are also like a big thing in zelda as well too so especially like skyward sword and i was just kept thinking about that throughout because some of those birds are really scary too um but yeah i just i absolutely loved the watch of this today i think it was great watching it and having it at tiff because there was such an excitement surrounding this film this year and knowing that it was opening tiff and it was one that's playing a lot i think it's probably has the most screenings out of any other tiff film this year i was looking at the list of the amount of times it's playing the amount of you know press screenings that's happening we just went to a we didn't go to a press screening for this because we probably would have been lining up for hours we went to a, a ticketed event for this we got tickets for this one um and watching with that audience and hearing their reactions and having moments that just genuinely just moved me and almost like made me swell up there's a scene in this film where um Mojito is just watching almost like these cute little characters they look like little lumas from mario galaxy that are that i think they're like oh, little beautiful souls right yeah. and like just seeing them flying and i just like i was just so overcome with just how beautiful that moment was and what was going on there obviously i'm not i don't want to I'm not going to spoil anything that's going on there, but there is so much. And as we're talking about it, and as each of us are kind of talking about moments that stood out to us, um, it, it really is something that just like, man, like I, I really do want to revisit this. I want to dive deeper and, and see uh, what else I pull from it and hear what other people have to think. Um, I'm curious if this will ever get a uh, English dub. I hope it doesn't, you know, cause you know, dubs traditionally aren't always like the greatest, you know, ways of experiencing like the films you know originally i know for shows it's a little bit different uh but i do want to ask you guys before we kind of wrap up again this we're not giving our final recommendations we've been talking about this film for about 25 minutes now what do you think studios particularly western studios are need to learn from the boy and the heron from from studio ghibli what do you think are the lessons that these studios need to take away from this film and hopefully bring to you know bring to the West and, and start using or reusing again. I think something that um, has started but isn't completely there yet is that you need to stop treating animation as a form of just making throwaway movies or making movies just for kids. I think, you know, we, we've gotten some really great animated movies that can transcend age groups. Uh, Studio Ghibli Films are no are no uh, foreigner to that at all and they they do such a great job of being accessible to children and also adults i think also putting the attention into the art and most importantly putting attention into the sound so many times you're watching an animated film and it's a such an animated reaction of a sound or, or something dropping one of the things that i wanted to quickly bring up as well was like the sound design of this film was fantastic the way a door oh, would open or creak the way a child would step on this on on a wooden floor and you'd hear that creaking or the door or, or a knife being unsheathed it's it's so funny you the say waves. that because i don't think about the foley waves. like the foley sound in a lot of movies because again it's one of those things you take for granted yeah but when it's done well and my god the boy in the heron does it beautifully Amazingly. i was thinking about every sound effect a yeah. lot of times i would look up because i could just feel the thunder and the rumble of, of yeah. what of what we were in and i just i don't know i just kept looking up like is that outside or is that in the movie like it's, it just <laughs> it felt so yeah. real i'm like man the sound design on this film from the the creaking of of, of Mahito walking up the wooden stairs to the grass to this the the crackling of the fire even the crackling yeah, of the, the fire the buzzing just, of the the arrow oh and how God. it just yeah it felt like you were wind they captured the wind so well yeah. in yeah. this uh, in this film I I think that's something that you know these movies do such a good job of there's so much attention and care into them and they take their time um you know movies like spider-verse that we just kind of got this year you can mm -hmm. tell that's a movie of labor and love in it and the fact that we don't have a date yet on beyond the spider-verse i think shows that there's there's that okay let's take our time let's just make the yes. best movie we possibly can and 
it doesn't have to be just, oh, this is for kids or it can be for anybody. And for sure, those movies do great too. The ones that are just for kids and everything is because obviously, mm-hmm. yes, kids need their own specific films as well. But man, you need to let, I think more adults just need to start to appreciate animation and stop thinking, well, I've grown out of it. No, you don't grow out of right. it. Right. You know, no. But you- and I think I go back to that quote that animation is a medium, not a genre. Yeah. Right. And I think that's, that's the big thing. Anthony, sorry. No, it, I was going to say that I think it's just a lot of those studios, they just, they look at animation as just a, a box office dump of money. They just look at it as money. And that's the problem with these studios. They don't look at it as, where we have Studio Ghibli who has created a movie that has no marketing and until it hit North America where <laughs> we need marketing. Got one trailer. <laughs> we, need, we, we got the trailers, we got the pictures. Like this movie, when it opened Japan, there was nothing. There was, there was a post. I don't even know if there was a poster. There was... It was just the one poster. A trailer yeah. that had text on black and that's it. And then you go and I think Miyazaki wanted you to have no preconceived... Um, notions of what this movie was before you went into it and i think that's that's a lot like you're taking this huge risk but and and i'm not saying that all these animation movies and disney stuff should do it that way but i feel like you need to get out of the mindset of commercializing animation because you can't commercialize that art that's where the stories become mundane and dry and uh fake a lot of the times yeah but you know with pixar pixar i feel like is that closest thing to studio ghibli that we get but a lot of times they're they don't have the culture that we get from a studio ghibli film like you know it's japanese because they have like their they have their in-house look i think and obviously studio ghibli has their look but we're so we're so used to how pixar films look so either hyper realistic or they'll have that their stylized look to it where it's like right you want them to get a little bit crazier with it right but the culture i feel like there's I'm not going to say it, but American culture is not the greatest when it comes because there is no culture there. And that's that's that is a fact. But when it comes to Japanese culture and any type of other culture in the world that (laughs) is is shown in such animation, there is heart that comes out of it. And you can't get that in anything that's coming from Disney and coming. And there are parts like you could say we have Coco, which is beautiful and all that. And Coco, okay, yeah, even Wish coming out later this year, like well, you could see much. that they're taking different swings with uh with different things, right? I, and I hope, like, but it'll never compare yeah. to what we get out of Studio Ghibli. Sorry, sorry, guys. Yeah, it's it's no, it's true. But here's the thing, like with with Miyazaki, potentially this is his last film. You know, hopefully he's going to keep making films. We're going to see what's going to happen. Um, but I can only hope that their work is going to continue there. It's going to inspire creators, and and obviously their work inspires, you know people who are making films here in Canada and the U S and, you know, we've had a, an amazing year for animation. When you look at, you know, Mario brothers killing at the box office and, you know, spider verse do, doing something incredible. And then even Ninja turtles having a different art style. I'm hoping we're starting to see even elemental, like changing things up for Pixar with just like visually how they do things. Like I really hope that we're getting to a place where we could tell different stories and have different ways of, you know, of our animation being given to us, but also, you know, I think, you know, we really miss the look of 2d animation oh as well too. Right. It's I, been, it's been like 20 plus years, almost 25 years um, of like the same kind of look that we've been getting for all animated films, right. Where you should just be Pixar yeah. that was doing films like that. So we'll see what happens in the future, but I think it's safe to say that uh, the boy and the heron is definitely worth your time. If you're able to see it at the festival, do it. And we'll keep you up to date on the movie podcast when it gets a wide release because we are, you know, we're the best movie podcast out there. Come on. You know, you're in the right spot already. Stay here. Uh, If you want to keep following us at Tiff and see all the fun stuff that we're up to, make sure you follow us at the movie podcast on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Letterboxd. We have lots of tip coverage coming your way. We have some really cool stuff heading out um, on the feed and on YouTube at the end of the week so make sure you stay tuned for some really cool stuff happening there lots to look forward to it's a very busy month for us but we love what we're doing i want to say thank you again to our friends at Mubi for sponsoring today's episode make sure you check out the links below our show notes our description to get a month free of incredible cinema and following us uh, and to see where to follow us on all social media platforms you do want to do that uh, and join our discord because we're having some great conversations in there that was this time with the movie podcast and we'll see you next